This morning I'll be talking to us very briefly on the inheritance of the saints. The inheritance of the saints. I want you to give us 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Keep going, please. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. Tell your neighbor, I have an inheritance in Christ. The Bible says that inheritance does not decay. That inheritance does not suffer inflation. It doesn't lose value like currency. It is undefiled. If anything, it grows in leaps and bounds all the time. But let's read it in the message translation, verse 3 and 4. Let's see what it says. It's simpler there, and it will help you to give you context. It says, what a God we have, and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master, Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Hallelujah. We have everything to live for. Verse 4, including a future in heaven. And that future starts now. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> ah. Are you not entertained? He said, What a life. Because Jesus rose. Just last weekend, we we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, right? Because he rose, we've been given a brand new life. And we've got everything to live for. Listen, you're not dying. Are you hearing me? You're not going anywhere because you have everything to live for. So when the devil brings any form of discouragement into your spirit, and I don't know why we keep talking about discouragement and depression this morning. I want you to quote this scripture to him that I have everything to live for. If your body tells you you should give up, tell your body I have everything to live for. If your finances tell you, give up, tell your finances, I have everything to live for. If your children, your career, whatever is telling you, give up, speak to that thing with the word of God, I have everything to live for. I'm not I'm just getting started. I have everything to live for. And when you speak those words, you will feel the energy of, your, of the spirit enter into you. And you will see yourself bubbling again. Hallelujah. You have everything to live for. Look at verse 4. Including a future in heaven. And that future starts now. What does that mean? You are one leg in heaven, one leg on earth. So you download the experiences of heaven and leave them here. Brothers and sisters, your life will be sweet. According to this scripture. When I know they hear me this morning. He said that future. So the realities of heaven for us is not just longer a futuristic thing. It is now. You know, before Jesus left this earth, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. Just believe in, believe in God. Believe also in me. There are a lot of, you know, mansions in my father's house. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. So King James says he has reserved that inheritance. What is an inheritance? An inheritance is something that is bequeathed to somebody by reason of genetics. You inherit something, a genetic quality, you inherit property, you inherit, inherit money, you inherit lands, whatever, as an offspring from a parent. And the Bible says God has given us that inheritance. And we are not waiting until we get to heaven to enjoy it. We begin to enjoy it here. That's what our scripture is saying. He said you have everything to live for. So I've come this morning to tell you don't give up. Tell your neighbor don't give up. Because you've got everything to live for. Including a future in heaven. And that future starts now. So now this is the lesson here. If you have not been pursuing your dreams with passion and fervency, I want you to go back. Dust them. Wherever you abandon them, go back. 
bring out your, your, your vision boards, everything you have abandoned, dust your dreams, begin to pursue them because you've got everything to live for. By January, a lot of you have wrote, written goals for yourself. Go and look at them. This is April. Read them. That amount you said you're going to close the year with, you will get it. Yeah. That business you want to start, you will start it. Yeah. That ministry you want to birth, you will birth it. Yeah. That house you want to build, you will build it. Yeah. That company you want to start, you will start it. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. That degree you want to earn, you will earn it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Because you've got everything to live for. Including a future in heaven. And this is a good place to tell you if you, you're sure. If you're not sure that your name is in heaven written in that book. I want you to just make a decision before the end of this service. So you can enjoy this. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for Jesus. So we have an inheritance. You've seen it clearly from the Bible. Now, one of the things from the little I know about God, very little I know about God, one of the things I've come to realize about God is that God is a family man. God is a family man, right? And his role in his family is the role of a father. You know, we call God by so many names. We give him titles. Uh, my deliverer, my provider, my messiah, my savior, my defender, my, my in fact some, some people even call God my weapon of war. You can imagine God is your weapon to kill people. <laughs> so we call him by so many names but there is one name we have played down and that's the name he loves most. It is the name Father. It's the name Father. It's the name Abba. Abba means what? Father. If a father here, you have kids, you know that you, 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 you enjoy hearing your children call you what? Daddy. Don't you enjoy it? Of course you do. It's not different with God. God is the one who started the family business. He created it. The Bible says it is from him all father who does what flows. Every family in heaven and on earth is named after him. It draws its origin, its source. The, name, the word father actually means source. It draws its origin and its source from God. So God is the original father. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So, but today we have played down that name and its meaning. Because we have been taught, for whatever reason, to use God. So we come to God for solutions, not for relationship. We come to God asking him to supply our needs, to heal us, to give us. God, give me this, give me this. Some of you have lists for God. Your list is even longer than marriage, marriage list. Say, God, on the 13th of April, I want this. 5th of May, I want this. 6th of August, I want this. And if God does not do it, you go on strike. Praise the Lord. But before he is any of those things, before he is our provider, before he is our healer, before he is our protector, be before he is our deliverer, before he is our savior, he is first and foremost what? The Father. And so something happened. One day the disciples, members of Jesus' church came to him and said, Sir, teach us how to pray. Just like John has taught his members how to pray. And Jesus didn't turn them down. He said, okay, let me tell you how to pray. Give them a model for the prayer. He said, pray like this. Our Father who lives in heaven. We honor your name, you know, and so on and so forth. He started that lesson by saying our... What did he say? Our, our Father. But if you attend our prayer meetings today in church... When we want to call Father, we don't call him the way Jesus called. We will shout. We will shout. In fact, the pastor will tell you, shout. Let it go beyond this roof and pass the first heaven and pass the second heaven so that it will reach where God is. 
Now, let me ask you a question. If you're going to your father to ask him for anything or to have a conversation with him, do you shout his name? If you call your father on phone, do you scream? No, answer me now. So I'm here leading prayers. And then I want you to pray fervently. Because I'm trying to motivate you because you need motivation to pray, which is a serious aberration. I have to find a way to help to make you pray. And then I'll tell you to shout. I'll ask you to put your hands on your head and say, my father, my father. My father, my... Is that how you call your daddy? Is that how your children call you? No, you both should answer me. Is that how you, you, they call you? Do you know why you shout? Because you don't see him as your father. If you see him as your father, you don't have to shout. That was the behavior of many people in the days Jesus walked the earth. And, and so he told them something. He said, which of you here, your child will ask you for bread, you give him a stone, right? Ask you for egg, you give him a scorpion. Ask you for fish, you give him a serpent. He said, if you being evil, know how to give good gifts. How much more your heavenly one? He said, your heavenly father. If you study the Bible very well and you read the teachings of Jesus and the things he said, as written in the New Testament, you will see that he always called God word Father. The most important accomplishment of manhood, the greatest accomplishment of every man is to be a father. True or false? That's the greatest accomplishment. Is to be a father not just biological father to, to play the role of a father in the life of people listen to me it's not that those people are going to bring you money or build you houses there is a joy that comes to anybody who plays the role of a father in another person's life what is that joy that these people recognize you they, they love you they bring you joy when you see them succeed you're happy when your child comes back from school with a, a, a good result how do you feel don't you feel excited you feel very happy and proud we read it in the bible he said your people you are becoming a community of people that will make me proud that's what god was saying there the most, most important role god wants to play in your life is the role of a father so God is the family man. He's the one who started his family business. And this fact, the fact that God is a family man who has a dream of a family, a family comprising sons and daughters, was the reason why he put a plan in place so he can save us. That was the reason why Jesus died. So he can come and recover the lost family of God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 God had desired a family long time ago. And he had to put in plan a place that will help him accomplish that desire. He had a dream that one day his children will be gathered around his dinner table. And then they'll be jumping around the house. Seeing them happy. Making requests. Worshipping him. Calling him father. Celebrating his faithfulness serving him obeying him these are the things that bring joy to the heart of a father and the bible calls them spiritual sacrifices sacrifices of worship so when you lift up your hands and wave them you're waving them to your father when you dress well and come to church it's because you want to appear decent before your father are you hearing me it's not because you want to show up christianity is actually not a religion even though a religion has been made out of it Christianity is about this relationship, simple relationship of a father and his family. It is nothing more than that. It's not a code, it's not, it's not a body of laws, it's not, it's not a code of ethics, even though all that have been, have been made, it's not, it's, not, it's not laws that have been given, even though laws have been made out of Christianity, even though ethics have been established out of Christianity, but believe me, Christianity is simply a relationship. And that's the greatest desire in the heart of God. Unfortunately today, especially in Africa, we have turned Christianity to something we cannot even describe. Into a religion that uses God for its own selfish reasons. 
How do I know that? Look at how all our services are structured. Look at how all our prayers are made. Look at how we behave before God. See how we even shout at him. See how we even... So we just come together and just, just do stuff, raise money, do this one, entertain ourselves, and then we sweat, and then we go home. But the question is, the inheritance the father has promised the children, how much of that are we enjoying? The Bible says he has reserved that inheritance for us. That inheritance is incorruptible. It doesn't decay. The only qualification to that inheritance is to be a member of that family. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody has a role that they play in their family. The father has a role. The mother has a role. The children have a role. And that's the same thing that God has done. I don't have time. Time is running. I'll just say this in, in a few words and, and then we'll go. That's the same thing that God has done. He has his role that he plays in our lives. God the Father has his role. God the Son has his role. God the Holy Spirit has his role. God the Father is the source of all things, the provider of all things, our Father in heaven. And God the Son is the one who came to do what? To reconcile us back to God. Hallelujah. And now that he has gone back to heaven, the Bible calls him our intercessor, our advocate. That's a legal word. We have senior lawyers in this house. An advocate is someone who speaks on behalf of another people before the judge, right? Hello? That is the role that Jesus plays in the family. So if we're, going to, if we're going to describe the responsibility of Jesus now in that aspect, we will say that Jesus is the family lawyer today, right? Hello? I'm trying to use words that we can relate with. But before Jesus left the earth to go and assume those duties in heaven, he made us a promise. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'll send you another comforter. The Holy Spirit. He said, this comforter is not going to walk by your side. He will live inside of you. This comforter will comfort you. He will be your helper. He will help you. And then he will guide you into all truth. He will give you revelations of things to come. He will give you ideas on how to run your business. He will help you to, to excel in whatever it is you're doing. This is the kind of inheritance we have. So you have God the Father who is in heaven. You have Jesus who is our lawyer interceding for us, making advocacy for us. And you have the Holy Spirit who is presently living inside of us, helping us, comforting us. That's why it is impossible. The word, the word comfort then means to bring the presence of God and fill your heart with the presence of God. Because in his presence, there is fullness of joy. Are you hearing me? So each time you lose joy, each time you're anxious in your life, what you need is that comfort of the Holy Spirit. That's the role he plays in your life. He brings God's presence where there is fullness of joy and furnishes it in your spirit and in your heart. And even though things around you are not working out the way you expect, you still have joy. So you must understand the role that God the Father plays, God the Son plays, God the Holy Spirit plays. And then he's our helper who helps us. It does not matter the kind of help. See, listen to me. There is no help that is too much or too little for the Holy Spirit to provide. Are you hearing me? When you're walking on the street and you're looking for an address and you miss a, an address, ask the Holy Spirit. If you're going to write your examination and you forget the answer to certain questions, as you have studied or as you have learned, please ask the Holy Spirit. He provides this help at every point in time. But because we have left the relationship that exists in a family, and then we have jumped out of the boat of, of family and relationship into religion, we neglect these things. We now use the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues. For fanatism and extremism we jump we scream we shout we swear that's what we do the holy spirit was not given to us just so we could speak in tongues the holy spirit was not given to us just so we could quote scriptures it's given to us to be our standby helper and this morning i've come to remind you of the realities of the kind of relationship you have with god and in case you have not been enjoying the benefits of being in a family relationship with god i want you to know that god is still on the head of the table as a father and he's passing the bread to the children he's passing the tea to the children he's paying the school fees of the children he's providing the needs of the children he hasn't lost his touch. 
He is a father. And so you can walk up to him and say, Father, please give me the bread. Today we have taken ourselves from the place of sons to the place of servants. Our reality has become the situation of the prodigal son. No, not, yeah, the prodigal son and the elder brother of the prodigal son. Who complained that the father is spending too much money throwing a party for his, elder, his younger brother who, who absconded and left the family business. But the father told him something. He said, everything I have belongs to you. He told the father, I've been working for you all these years. And that's the mistake. We're too busy working for God that we forget that this God is a father. We should develop our relationship with him. We should spend time in fellowship, in communion. That's what he wants. In the book of Sons of Solomon, I think chapter 2, he said, I want to hear your voice because your voice is sweet. When was the last time God heard your voice? I, I was telling the brethren in Wealth Place on Wednesday, I said, let me tell you something. The reason why God allows certain situations to happen in your life, to, to, to occur in your life is because when things happen, you run to him and he hears your voice. For some of you, the only time that you call upon God, the only time that you pray, the only time that you sing unto God, even though you're always singing in your bathroom, but it is not unto God. Now only you know what they sing. But the only time you sing unto God, it is when you're in trouble. The only time you pray is when you're in trouble. Now, God says, I love your voice. Your voice is sweet in my ears. I want to hear your voice. If God wants to hear your voice every time, and the only time he can hear your voice is when you enter into trouble, why do you think he will not allow trouble to come? No, reason now. No, it, it sounds funny. Le no, you listen to me. It sounds funny. Let me, let me show you a scripture. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 19. Put it there. Put it there. Jeremiah 3, 19. But I said, how shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, thou shalt call me what? My father. And shall not turn away from me. It looks like this is very complex. Put it in the message translation. See, see how simple it is. I planned what I'd say if you returned to me. Good. I'll bring you back into where? I'll bring you back into where? That was God speaking. We don't have time to read the entire thing. When you go read the, the pretext, the, the earlier verses and the succeeding ones. I'll bring you back into the family. I'll give you choice land. Land that the godless, godless nations will do what? Will die for. And I imagine that you will say what? Dear Father. And will never go off This is what a lot of us have done. God just wants to hear you call him dear father. And this morning he has asked me, sent me to bring you back, to ask you to come back to the family. He's asked me to tell you, please come back. Doesn't matter how far you've gone. I don't want to shout, I just want to say it in the simplest way possible. Come back to the family. There's a lot for you on the table. Come back to the family. Jump out of the religious boat. It's not enough. Coming to church doesn't mean that you're in the family. You can spend your entire time in church. You come to church every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year. And yet you're not in the family. Come back. Come back. There's an inheritance prepared for you with a guarantee. He said, I'll give you choice lands. Lands that people will kill for. That's just one of it. All I just need is to hear you call me what? Dear Father. You heard what Pastor Charles said. He said when God's servant went to see him in the hospital when he had that, that accident, he told him, son, don't worry about anything. That's the heart of the Father. 
I want you to just stay on this bed, focus on getting well, leave the praying to us, leave the finances to us. Stay here and rest. That's a father speaking. If a man can say that, how much more God? We have been taught to think that God is one big judge holding a stick by his hand, you know, just sitting there. And so when you're coming to him, you say, oh, yeah, where are you there all this time? He wants you to come home. He wants you to take his word seriously. Jesus said in John 15, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask anything and my father who is in heaven will give it to you. God told me personally, I wrote it in my book, God told me, he reminded me yesterday, God told me personally that my word is my DNA. If you want to receive anything from me, let my word live inside of you. My word is my DNA. It is the genetic material that conveys my character. So that was when I understood what Jesus said. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask for anything. I was praying one day and the Lord told me, stop insulting me with your prayers. Ask me for big things. Stop acting like you're some beggar somewhere who, who has lost his father. You are a son. And today have I begotten you. Ask me for anything. Nations as a present. Continents as a price. Psalm 2 verse 7. Put it on the screen. Verse 7. Let me tell you what God said next. He said, you are my son, and today is what? Oh. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. He said, what do you want? Name it. Nations as a birthday present. Continents as a price. I will give them to you. You established a business in Calabar, and you thought that that's it. With due respect to your effort and everything, we celebrate your tenacity. But listen to me. The world is your constituency. That's what God wants to give to you. He wants you to take you, he wants to take you to a place where your name will mean something. I know that we Africans are not big on legacies and all, but believe you me, God wants to give you a legacy. He wants to make you an eternal sign, a generational sign. So that every time that product is being used, your name will be remembered. That's what it means. Your influence will go across the nations, across the continents, because you are my son. So enough of religion. That's why Jesus died, to bring us back to the table, to bring us back to the family. So the Lord can give us his inheritance. And then he can send us on errands so we can represent him wherever we find ourselves. That's why Jesus Christ said, you're the light of the world. Wherever you go, I want you to shine the light of the family. When I was leaving home and going to the university, my father called me. He said, listen to me, my son. He said, listen to me, my son. You know the family you come from. You know the kind of values I've put inside of you. I hear a lot of things about the university these days. But I want you to remember that character is not a shirt. That when it is dirty, you pull it off and wear another one. Your character follows you everywhere. My father told me, I don't want you to go back with, to go there with these values and come back with another set of values. I want you to protect the family name. He said, I want you to protect the family name. Remember the family you come from. When my father died and I wrote a tribute, that was what I wrote as a tribute to him. Remember the family name. Today, a lot of believers have made a mess of the family name. We use the name of the Lord in vain. We use the name of, the, of Jesus in vain. Jesus is not a money doubler, brothers and sisters. Jesus is not your errand boy. The one you sent to go and kill your enemy. This morning, I've come to ask you to remember the family you come from. Remember the family name. Protect the family name. Wherever you are, remember to shine the light of this family. To honor God in all your dealings.
put him first. And when you do that, it gives you access to the family name, to the family wealth, to the family inheritance as a son, not just a servant. There is nothing you're looking for that God cannot deliver to you. He said, I'll give you nations. Do you know what that means? I'll give you nations. I'll give you nations. I'll give you nations. First Samuel chapter 2, I wrap up now. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. Let me show you how it works. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, and the message translation. He said, he puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles born out lives with fresh hope. Restoring dignity and respect to their lives. That's what the Lord can do for his children. He puts poor people on their feet again. The Lord will put you on your feet again. As a father, if you have made a shipwreck of your life, and you have lost hope, he rekindles bond out lives and gives you fresh hope. May my God give you fresh hope. May he rekindle your life even if you're born out. Restoring dignity and respect to their lives. Giving them a place in the sun. That's what God does. If your life has been afflicted with any form of failure and shame this morning, I speak to you on that God. May our Father in heaven restore respect and dignity to your life. In the name of Jesus. That's what he does. That's his specialty. He cleans up the mess. Puts on your feet again. Helps you with his spirit. And places you on the path. And ask you to proceed. That's what David said in, the, in this. He said, He brought me out. He inclined his ears towards me, his eyes towards me, and he brought me out of the pit where, in the, where there was the miry clay, wherein there was no water. He steadied my feet. He, he set my feet on, upon the solid rock. By his mercy, God will recover you from wherever you have wandered to. Everything that has taken the love of the Father away from your heart. I release God's mercy over you. May the mercy of God recover you. In the name of Jesus. The father is standing by the gate like the father of the prodigal son. Looking out into the far distance. To the horizon. Expecting that one morning the children will return home. So I've come here this morning to ask you to come home. Tell your neighbor come home. And when you return home. God is happy. And he throws a party in heaven. And my Bible says there's a party in heaven. Over one child that comes home. King James says over one sinner that repents. There's always a party. That's what the father of the prodigal son thought, did in Luke 15. God wants to throw a party on your head. And then your name is written in the book. What we call the book of life is actually the family birthday book. In heaven. You know every family has a family book, right? When a child is born, they write the name of the child. They write the day he was born, his birthday. What the Bible, King James calls the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, is the family birthday book. So they write your name. You were born on Susud, in Susud's place, and you're a member of this family. Hallelujah. The question I want to ask you this morning is your name in the family birthday book. Come home. Come home. Don't be deceived by the doctrines of demons flying around. God has given us his will in his word. And I want you to take the word of God very seriously. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, all scripture is the inspiration of God. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And it's profitable unto doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, thoroughly furnished. We come to church to be equipped, to be trained. I said verse 16. So we can do good works. He created us for them, good works. As a member of the family of God, we are expected to bring forth good results. Wherever you are, shine the family light. 
like your father will encourage you, make good grade in school. Don't fail in your business. Don't fail in your marriage. Be an example of the believer. Be an example of a member of this family, wherever you find yourself, and make the family proud. That's what that scripture means. That's all God needs from you. And no matter where you have compromised, I want you to come home this morning. That's why we need to take the Bible very seriously. The Bible is not an ordinary book. There's a lot of argument flying around on social media. Don't follow that rubbish. The Bible is the book, the revelation of God the Father, the revelation of God the Son, and the revelation of the fallen state of man, and the good news that Jesus brought, and the role he played in reconciling children back to their father, and the eternal salvation plan of God to bring his children back to himself. That's what the Bible is. It's a revelation of God the Father. So take it seriously. Forget. If you read the Bible as a book of archaeology and history, it, you may find it to have flaws, to have errors. Are you hearing me? I cannot guarantee you that the Bible will be flawless when you study it as a historical material or a literary compilation. No, I can't guarantee you that because it was written by men. So we don't pay attention on whether the grammar is right or wrong. In fact, some of the grammar is not right. But that's not what the Bible is meant for. In fact, the Bible is not even a business book. It's not a book that gives you a solution just like you. First and foremost, if you want to derive profit from the scripture, you must study it as a book that reveals God the Father and his plan to bring his children back to himself. Paul told Timothy in that place, he said, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Study the Bible like that. Don't go into all this argument whether the Bible, the Bible has 66 books, but there are other books that were written by the same authors that didn't make it to the Bible. If God wanted them to be in the Bible, he would have allowed them to go into the Bible. The Bible says, Scripture was given by the inspiration. What inspiration? The breath of God. So these people wrote it over a, a period of 1,500 years. It was written by about 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. But God breathed on, upon every one of them and they brought out the intention of God concerning his family. And they did not allow their humanity to interfere. That's why you could see some of the authors of the Bible, they wrote about their weaknesses. They didn't hide anything because it was the inspiration of God. When they were writing it, they didn't know that they were writing a Bible for us. They were just putting down the things as God laid it in their hands. So read the Bible for that revelation of Jesus. And it will change your life. Before anything else, get a revelation of God as your father. Your life will change. In the name of Jesus. Rise to your feet. Give me Acts chapter 20 verse 32. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. Lift up your hands everybody. I don't have time to continue in this message. There's no time. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. Please, quickly. Lift up your hands everybody. Lift up your hands, close your eyes. I want you to say amen as I declare this scripture. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Yes. Which is able to build you up. Yes. And give you an inheritance. Yes. Among all them which are sanctified. Yes. I pray for you this day. That the Lord, our Father in heaven, will keep you. Yes. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. Put your hands down. If you're here, you're not born again. Your name is not in that family birthday book. Or you were born again before, but you, you ran out of the family for whatever reason. I want you to lift up your hands. I give you an opportunity to return to the Father. That is the heartbeat of the Father. He wants you to come home. If you're here, I want you to just see you raise your finger. And I will pray for you. Now lift up your hands, everybody. I pray that God Almighty will sustain you. Yeah. With the inheritance he has reserved for you. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. From now on, nothing will take you away from the family. Because God has put you back on your feet. Things will get better and better for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will flourish and you will thrive. And everything is going to be alright for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you Lord for your word. We give you thanks. To you alone be all the glory. In Jesus mighty name.